From the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. It is 30 minutes into the U.S. trading day on Friday, July 22nd. Here are the top market stories that we're following for you at this hour. You got a global bond rally sizzling, yields tumble, investors flood into the belly of the curve. German a two year bond yield sinks the most since 2008. Why? Because you got some serious PMI pain. Activity in Europe slows to a crawl. Recession fears mount, while business activity in the U.S. shrinks for the first time since 2020. The market rethinks central bank rate hikes. And earnings angst, Twitter revenue missing estimates, Verizon lowers its outlook. American Express, though, sees spending soar. What earnings are saying about the economy? From New York, I'm Alex Steele with Anna Edwards in London. Guy Johnson is off today. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. Uh, Anna, on an economic front, I thought that the news was really going to be, be the European PMIs, we're, which, yes, were terrible. But just 15 minutes ago, we get the services PMI here, which is in contraction territory and a huge stunner for the market. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And it seems no matter which side of the Atlantic you look right now, you're getting bad news uh, in terms of expectations about where growth goes. Certainly some indicators suggesting either economies are already in contraction or parts of them, parts of the, some sectors are in contraction. And how this is being interpreted by markets, really interesting, Alex. Certainly here in Europe, the conversation has been, OK, so that's really bad. But does that mean that central banks don't hike as much? And that seems to be a continuation of, of, of some of the things we've been dealing with over the past week. Yeah, it feels like is the bad news now good news scenario is we're kind of back to that at this point. So um, let's tie all of this together, which leads us to the question of the day, which is earnings plus economy equals, huh? What are earnings telling us about the underlying economy? Let's break that all down with Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow in San Francisco and Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta in New York. Um, Kriti, I thought we were going to be leading with Snap and Twitter, but I just want to get your take on what's going on with the PMI. It's a services data here that really underlying weakness. Is the bad news good news? Is that the theme for today? It is, I think, when you look at the bond market. When you look at the equity market, I think it's a little bit of a different story. But the bond market, you are already seeing some pretty crucial moves. And a lot of that really stemmed over in Europe when you saw that really weak German data in particular. The UK data is still in expansionary territory. But a lot of that European sentiment is flooding into the United States now, which I think is interesting when you're looking at the bull case for Treasuries, the idea that you still have that widening spread between Italian BTPs and German boons. And that bid for German boons, that, I think, is what's driving the sentiment for Treasuries at the moment. OK, so we're not sure what to do with stocks in the U.S. We're kind of all over the place. Uh, but uh, certainly buying stocks here in Europe and bu buying uh, fixed income, to your point, Chrissy. Ed, uh, talking about let's go to technology because that's where we've had a lot of the uh, earnings news from. And that's what we yeah. thought was going to be certainly the top story this morning for markets until, to Alex's point, we got that uh, most recent data. What's the big takeaway for you from this tech readout from Snap and from Twitter? I mean, there's a lot of focus on ad spending. Yeah, it's certainly that there are inflation cracks showing in this early part of the earnings season. Also, that big tech, although Snap and Twitter, I wouldn't generally regard as big tech, are not uh, impenetrable to the macro headwinds that we're seeing across corporate America, across the world. It's been a really weird few days, right, where you have these kind of quite bullish signals that we had the Bloomberg survey of economists on where inflation's at right now, whether mm -hmm. we've peaked and what the Fed might do. The Nasdaq 100 has snapped three straight days of gains where we were kind of really jazzed. I was jazzed, guys, going into <laughs> next week in this kind of mega cap earnings season. And we've really rethought this overnight. We've mm -hmm. basically started to worry about actually how difficult this inflation will be for tech companies of all size to manage. And then in the background, you have the hiring freezes, which... Yeah has taken time to get on board people's minds. Well, this is, first of all, Ed, you can still be jazzed. It'll still be fun. But this is what I wanted to get the take on sort of the Snap and Twitter uh, issue in the advertising slowdown. Is yes. it because companies that usually advertise are themselves retrenching? Are they cutting yes. costs because they need to? Or are their products not selling? Because those are going to tell us two different things about the economy. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I said to John Farrow at the open that if you read Snap's earnings report, the transcript of the call, it's a very much a kitchen sink approach to what's happening. Mm -hmm. They say that in the last 90 days, there has been uh, a, a pretty good, was their words, deceleration in the ad market. And they cite inflation, the higher rate environment, the war in Ukraine, but also competitive headwinds, right? And you have to remember that Snap is competing for eyeballs against TikTok, which seems to be 
doing increasingly well. Twitter, again, was very interesting because the consistency is the macroeconomics, right? Higher inflation, uncertainty, and advertisers have shown signs of pulling back through the first half of the year. Um, the, the difference in Twitter's case, of course, and they put this in writing, is that there's uncertainty around Elon Musk's bid to buy the company. And, of course, advertisers may be thinking again about putting dollars with them. Mm, yeah, so that's a specific one to Twitter. More broadly, Chrissy, uh, back to what the, uh, the earnings have told us more broadly, I suppose, so not just in the tech space. We're getting a host of different factors being blamed. Uh, we've had the macro environment, and that links into ad spending, and that is relevant to the tech sector. We've also had some companies still talking about a shortage of parts. We've had some companies talking about the strength of the dollar. It is adding up to be quite a, a gloomy season, a gloomy, gloomy earnings report in that sense. It really is. And I think it's almost a little bit of a sense of deja vu because if you were covering the markets in 2020, which we all were, of course, one of the big, I think, standout pieces was that when you were looking at the tech trade, and bear with me here, not to give our audience a history lesson, but I think this is significant in terms of framing what we might see. In 2020, when you saw that tech trade, it wasn't a bundle tech trade. It was Apple, Microsoft outperforming. But the companies that had that ad revenue exposure, think Alphabet, think Meta, think Twitter, Snapchat, Pinterest, et cetera, they were underperforming that tech trade. I think that's really significant piece. And the idea was simply in the face of uncertainty, do a lot of these businesses actually want to spend any advertising at all? Then fast forward to 2021 when that supply chain issue was a far, far bigger focus than perhaps a recession is right now. And once again, people were pulling back on advertising with this lot of the same names saying, well, if we don't can't actually get the products on our shelves, we really want to be advertising to consumers to begin with. So they were hitting that. Now you have a confluence of both factors here. The idea that you do have that recession Mm -hmm. kind of perspective, but you also have the supply chain issues. And on top of that, well, there isn't really that much to advertise to begin with in the face of a recession. This is pretty normal. Yeah. So it, it brings back the point that when you look at the broader market, sure, you perhaps have a return of that tech trade, the return of the haven trade. But even within that, there are nuances here that to some extent, there are parts of the tech market that we're just talking about, the social media names, that have that cyclical exposure, and that could end up yeah. becoming the Achilles heel of the entire market. And that's a cyclical part of tech. And then you have sort of the macro part, which is the dollar, of course. Yes, the Bloomberg dollar index is down by four-tenths of one percent, really dropping like a stone after we got those PMI numbers. But that's a headwind for big tech, most definitely. Morgan Stanley sees eight yeah. percent uh, downside for earnings because of that dollar. Um, what are you expecting to hear on that front? next week when we get into the really big tech guys like the Google, the Apple, the Amazons? Well, this is where you want to see if they pivot their strategies a little bit because the whole point of their, the why the dollar is hitting them so hard is because a lot of their exposure, the majority of their exposure, I should say, is international. These are American companies that have multinational exposure. So think Microsoft, for example. The Microsoft computers, for example, that are in every headquarter around the world, that bringing those profits back is going to be key. If this dollar case that you're seeing is really a consensus trade that this is going to be strength that doesn't abate, do a lot of these companies say, well, okay, maybe we need to pull back on our international exposure a little bit to face these currency headwinds. I think that's the trade-off I would really pay attention to. And Ed, you were mentioning in passing the job losses and this becoming a bigger yes. and bigger theme as we watch big tech. And I suppose that it'll be a focus next week, won't it, when we move on to some bigger tech? Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, Bloomberg's done a lot of reporting, particularly Apple, where there was a lot of focus on hiring being frozen. You know, these are companies with strong balance sheets. That's probably an understatement. And that mm. move by Apple, which Bloomberg reported, was seen as somewhat conservative. Um, going into earnings season, if you don't subscribe to the Tech Watch column on the Bloomberg terminal, you absolutely must. But we've gone from thinking about this growth narrative to protecting the bottom line at all costs. You consider the stronger dollar and the likes of Microsoft, like Critty was just talking about, but also profit in this inflationary environment, the hiring freeze, because many of these companies are still trying to unwind the massive boom they went through through the pandemic period. They've become bloated in many areas. Sources at all these companies tell me there are many roles in duplicate where they have two people doing the same job. And the environment's changed quickly. And you do wonder how closely the language of executives like Tim Cook will be watched on how cautious they are about the second half of this year and whether hiring freezes turn into job cuts. OK, thanks very much. Thanks to Chrissy Gupta. Thanks to Ed Ludlow as well. Thanks to both of you for joining us to take uh, a deep dive into the tech sector once again, but also the broader earnings themes coming through so far. We just had a little bit of breaking news coming through on the grain front. We've been watching this uh, ceremony taking place in Istanbul, bringing together, we understand, the Russians and the Ukrainians to talk about uh, getting grain that's been trapped in Ukraine out. We're watching the UN Secretary General here talking about this, saying this will bring relief and help stabilise prices. We'll get more detail, though. What exactly has 
have these parties signed up to and how long will it take to have an impact? It has been moving grain prices over the past 24 hours, so we'll certainly keep an eye on that. And we have a guest in the second hour of this programme to talk more about it. Coming up, uh, though, next, more on our question of the day. What are earnings saying about the economy? We will ask Federated Hermes senior equity strategist Linda Dussel, who joins us next. This is Bingo. The alternative uh, to let your foot up off the brake before inflation has come down, let it settle at four and five percent. That's just a recipe for another recession down the road. That's a recession for prolonged pain, making the agony longer and longer, stretching out over years. That's not good for the American public. I think they realize that. That was Richmond Fed President Jeffrey Lacker on Bloomberg TV saying the Federal Reserve will do whatever it takes to get inflation down. That was before that PMI number uh, that broke about an hour later. So to the question of the day, what are earnings telling us about the economy? And what is the economy going to tell us about earnings? Want to ask uh, Linda Dussel, Federated Hermes uh, Senior Equity Strategist. Um, Linda, we have a lot of moving parts. The PMI, particularly services, really disappointing. A huge move in the bond market here as well as in Europe. And earnings that are extremely confusing, but does show that consumers are going to spend and do stuff uh, but tech is really feeling pain. What are we learning? Well, good morning, Alex. I, I think what we're learning is that it's a big mess out there, as you, as you suggest. And uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. And so it seems that the markets are moving quickly from one direction to another. So the direction in which the bond market has priced in an impending recession, uh, and as quickly as it has done, is really quite amazing. And so, you know, we at Federated Hermes are not calling for a recession. We think we may just skirt one next year. We think the 10 year bond yield should be in and around three and a quarter by this year in. If, we, if you believed that, you wouldn't be buying bonds, even if you were nervous. You look at the consumer, the consumer in the United States is really quite healthy. And even though there are job layoffs, and we're going to hear more about them, I think, in this earnings seasons, definitely from the tech sector that probably overhired, there are still way too many job openings. The job market is very, very tight. And that, I think, is what the mm. Fed is going to look at as they do what they must and raise rates. Right. Mm. And I wonder what you make of, so, so you sound pretty gloomy on the, the earnings story that we've got so far, Linda. And I know that Bloomberg Intelligence were calling this uh, the weakest earnings season since early 2020. And we all know why that went so sour so quickly. How bad does it get? And crucially, what's the link between a bad earnings season and what stocks do? Well, the, the stocks look forward. So the stock market has already been worried about this current earnings season. So we're not as concerned about what companies say about what has happened as what they think will happen as they look forward. And so if you look at the behavior of company, we saw capital expenditures are up 7% on a year-to-date basis this year. That is a bullish move in terms of the economy. The CEO roundtable has been kind of bullish and still, you know, still pretty decently strong on on, uh, on hiring in certain areas. I realize certain areas did overhire and they need to fire. So we're not particularly gloomy, mm -hmm. but we're very much interested in what they have to say about the future. And I think, you know, they could be, they could be more conservative looking out into the future. We're looking at more of a malaise than terrible news. Yeah. Linda, 5 percent earnings growth. Mm -hmm. Linda, what's also interesting though, is it that earnings worry most definitely out there um, but Bank of America in their global uh, survey in terms of uh, their data and sort of what investors are positioned for said that that gloom is not actually felt in the global equity funds and that people haven't sold. They're worried, but they haven't sold yet. What kind of volatility does that mean we're going to see in the next couple of weeks as the numbers start coming out? That's exactly right, because there, uh, there's too much money still right now on the sidelines. There's too many people watching very, very closely, and they want to get, you know, they're, they're not positioned terribly defensively, although margin debt is down dramatically. It's down in most it's been since 2009. There's still a lot of money on the sidelines because there was so much money printed. So I think a lot of people are out there saying, I'm going to wait and buy uh, and buy low. I'm looking for buying opportunities. The VIX is uncomfortably low. The fear index is uncomfortably low. Why won't it go up? Because there's still too much money on the sidelines just waiting to buy the dip. And so what does the NASDAQ do in recent days and weeks? It's spikes. We need boring is what we need. And it's not going to be boring for a while, I'm afraid.
<laughs> well, I, I look forward to boring, Linda. Life's been a bit too exciting recently. Let me ask you about oil then. I know that you've said that oil could drop quite significantly to sort of 80, 85. Where does that leave you in terms of, well, why do you think that? Is that all because of a slowdown and slowdown in the global economy will produce that? And what does that mean for energy stocks into which many people have piled because of fears about inflation? Well, they have done very much so. It's been the place to, to be invested. It was the best sector last year. It was the best sector this year to date. And interestingly, as the price of oil has come down, you know, you see these stocks coming down. I think people are saying, you know, I made a lot of money in these stocks and I'm going to take this money off the table. Again, trader moves, fast moves. We're suggesting not necessarily that the price of oil goes to 80 to $85, but if it does do that, and which it very well could do because we all know about the concerns about global recession. If mm -hmm. it does do that in the near term, that might actually help consumer sentiment because yeah. that's very close to their concerns. But in the end, we're bullish on energy. We have an overweight there and you very well could see it go up dramatically into this winter as poor Europe and particularly Germany suffer the winter. And you have to say the read through from the oil services, though, is that companies are spending. EMPs and oil companies are spending billions now. Like they're ramping it up. Um, it just depends on how fast that comes to market. Um, Linda, in the meantime, you want boring. We're not getting boring. So do we buy bonds? I mean, that is the trade of the day. Like buy any bond you can get your hands on. Um, what do you do with that? Gosh, what's more boring than cash? Cash is king and we like cash. And by the time this year is out, you're going to see some pretty good numbers relative to what we have been on cash. No, the bond yield, the long bond yield is too low now. They priced it too quickly into recession. And as I suggested, we don't like that. As stocks go, we still like those high quality dividend paying stocks. So if we like energy, which I've said already, we like healthcare too. Uh, healthcare in general has been ignored for quite some years. You can get some excellent dividend paying stocks out there and if you're a good stock picker you could go over to Europe and find some excellent names over there too that are high quality that are stable companies that pay a dividend and will suffer uh, whatever recession that Europe must suffer just fine. Mm. Linda you mentioned a little earlier in passing your views on Europe I wonder how those views on Europe stack up against the US given all of the issues facing the European economy we saw that in the PMI data in Europe today certainly for Germany and one of the big headaches hanging over Germany is of course access to gas we're getting further headlines from uh, Gazprom uh, coming through with regards to turbines and the ones they do and don't have access to to send that gas from Russia to Germany it's all looking very opaque right now but what assumptions do you make then uh, that inform your European stock view? Okay, it's a big mess, just as you've suggested. And how can we invest when we're looking out to big mess? Who thinks they can uh, suggest how this is going to work out? Germany has very high inflation, just like the U.S. does. Our Fed's doing what they must do and raise rates. They can't raise rates over there. They've got so much to deal with as it is right now. You can say, and you could have said for years, that Europe is inexpensive versus the United States, and it is. The United States remains the safe haven. You've, you've spoken about the strength of our dollar. If it's come down lately, it's been extremely extremely, extremely strong. That has a lot to do with our relative safe haven status and the fact that we are raising rates, which we must do. So, you know, Europe is going to be a great, great buy, but uh, it would seem very premature to get involved in that, especially when we're suggesting cash. Yeah. <laughs> very okay, <funny>. Linda, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, we heard the message. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks to Linda Dussel of Federated Hermes. Thanks very much for joining us. Let's go from Europe to China with the news flow. And we're just getting some red hair. We've just, well, in the last 10 minutes or so, got these red headlines across the Bloomberg about China Evergrande. Let's pull all these together. This is a real estate firm based in China, of course, and we're getting some news flow surrounding this company. It's a property company. It became the poster child for all of the troubles that the uh, property industry was facing in China, which have since broadened. Well, they're talking about a new CEO. Their CEO has resigned. They've named a successor. They're also talking about appointing uh, an internal control, uh, controls consultant, so changing their risk management procedures, it seems. So late in the day on a Friday over in China, certainly, uh, we're getting this news flow. So we'll certainly watch whether this has any impact on Evergrande or indeed on the broader property sector, which has broadened in its, in its issues uh, since the Evergrande crisis. We will certainly watch that on Monday. Seems like a long way off, right? Still ahead, one of the big names in ETS, Kathy Wood, is shutting down one of her funds. We got that news this week. She's not the only fund manager making tough choices about, uh, about those funds and whether to shutter them. We'll talk about that next. This is Bloomberg.
It's time for the Bloomberg Business Flash. A look at some of the biggest business stories in the news right now. I'm Richard Kugupta. American Express posted second quarter revenue that soared 31% to a record. That led the company to raise its forecast for full year revenue. Meanwhile, the company's expenses rose a more than expected 32%. Now, Verizon has cut its full year profit and revenue forecast. The largest U.S. wireless carrier is trying to keep up with rivals who have made gains through heavy phone discounts. On Thursday, AT&T alarmed the industry watchers with a warning that some customers are starting to delay paying their phone bills. And Schlumberger is getting a boost from the global expansion in the search for oil and gas. The world's biggest oil-filled service provider raised its full-year sales forecast to at least $27 billion, beating the estimates. Schlumberger's second quarter profit also was better than expected. And that is your latest business flash, Alex. All right, thanks so much, Ritika. I appreciate that. Um, so, Anna, Kathy Woods uh, is closing down one of her ETFs, and this focused on companies that received very high scores on transparency. And for the first time, her ARK Investment Management has pulled the plug on an ETF. But she's not alone, Anna. ESG fund closures are also piling up after drawing in billions as investors are bracing for a recession and choosing safer bets in the market. I would also argue, Anna, that part of this is a tech thing. I mean, if you take a look at some mm -hmm. of the members within the ETF that she had to close, it's Spotify, yeah. it's Netflix, it's Splunk, it's NVIDIA, it's AMD. And that's a similar yeah. theme with the ESG funds as well. A lot of them actually yeah. wind up being tech companies. Absolutely. And so this ends up, this ETF was at the confluence of two very challenged themes. One of them was tech and one of them was ESG, in this case specifically transparency, but it falls maybe into the broader ESG, ESG theme, which, yes, yes, we want to talk about a lot. And yes, a lot of investors still want to talk about, but at the end of the day, we're also dealing with war in Europe. And that has changed people's perspective just a little. Yeah, it just sort of moves the S and the G versus the E. It's a lot of different interconnectedness there going on. All right, well, coming up, we're going to talk more on earnings. Very tough quarter for Twitter, going through that battle with Elon Musk. Just reported the disappointing sales numbers. We're going to speak to an analyst who is bullish on the stock, Barton Crockett of Rosenblatt Securities is coming up next. This is Bloomberg. We're about an hour into the U.S. trading session and looking at the S&P uh, pretty much flat on the day, despite those horrible PMI numbers uh, out of the U.S. Kriti Gupta is back tracking all the moves for us. Kriti? Yeah, Alex, I think waffling is a good term for what sure. the S&P like 500 it. is doing. But the Nasdaq decidedly underperforming here, down by six-tenths of one percent. But let's pull that into the context of the volatility we've seen lately with the stock market. It kind of feels like perhaps there's a little bit of a wait-and-see cautious mood in at least the benchmark level of what you're seeing. And you want to really keep an eye on the kind of subsectors within that because the, underneath the hood, if you look at some of the social media stocks, that's where a lot of the pain is, down 3.8%. We're going to dive into that in a second, but a quick check on the VIX here. A 22 handle. We're getting closer and closer to a 20 handle. That is significant as we talk about what the normal gauge of perhaps post-COVID low volatility is, and that is that 20 handle. So if it drops below 20, that might be a significant reason or a significant signal for some people to hop back into the market and to escape some of that volatility. But once again, let's get back to the social media story, because that's really where all the action is today in the equity market. A lot of that has to do with Snapchat. A barrage of, of bad news when it comes to Snapchat. Yes, they came up with some better than expected numbers when it came to users, but they are suspending their third quarter financial guidance. They're also, uh, they do have a stock buyback though, $500 million, but they're also slowing down some of their hiring. Very concerned about the advertising story. And remember, as a perhaps proxy for growth broadly, that is not a good sign. But nevertheless, investors really punishing the stock here. We're looking at a 10 handle on the share price, a 36% drop interest day already and that is kind of translating some of the other social media names pinterest for example taking it on the chin meta even twitter is lower what's interesting with twitter though is it's only down four tenths of one percent they came out with their earnings this morning they're talking about missing their revenue estimates but once again for that particular share price it might be more about the legal battle than perhaps their future growth and of course we're going to dive into that in the hours ahead across bloomberg television and bloomberg radio but it's not just the social media part of the tech complex that you want to keep an eye on it's semiconductors as well if you're talking about volatility in the likes of Apple, Microsoft, well, the ripple effects happen in the likes of the Sox Index, for example, your NVIDIA's, your 
microns. And right now you are seeing this massive sell-off pressure, but a little bit of a bounce back, which you can kind of see right here when it comes to semiconductors. And that might be a good sign if we're talking about the bull case for tech broadly. Usually semiconductors react first, the rest of tech falls. So that's going to be a major gauge to follow. On the macro sphere, though, let's bring it right back to bonds because that 30-year bond is crucial. It dropped below the 3% level. Remember, duration has been a major trade here. I wonder how much of this is going to be the haven trade. How sustainable is the bull case for treasuries right now, Anna? Mm -hmm. Okay, Chrissy, thank you very much. Chrissy was talking about Twitter, and we will continue to cover it in the hours ahead, but also in the minutes ahead. We'll do it right now. It's another blow to Twitter, which has already seen a fair share of blows the past few months. It reported disappointing second quarter sales, and that comes on top of its huge legal battle with Elon Musk. With us now, Barton Crockett, Senior Research Analyst at Rosenblatt Securities. He has a buy rating on Twitter with a $52 price target. He also lowered his rating on Snapchat to neutral from buy while trimming his price target very there. Uh, let's start with Twitter then, Barton. And you've got this <clears> price target and you've seen what they've said today. I'm guessing your target is really entirely based around the legal decision that's going to be made around whether Elon Musk can walk away or not. What are, what are the assumptions you're making? Right. I mean, our, our reading of the lawsuit, you know, with some help from some um, some advice is that um, he, uh, Twitter's in a very good position and um, Musk is very likely to um, Make, be, uh, see very clearly from the judge that he'll be compelled to do the deal. So our $52 price target is really just a slight break from the 5420 deal price, uh, just assuming there's a, um, a modest settlement to speed this along. But mm -hmm. we think there's a lot of leverage on Twitter's side. And you can see from your stock board there earlier that it's nice to have something other than fundamentals to drive a stock, which is what we can get with Twitter right now. So Barney, it also seems to think that he won't pay for Twitter at a lower price because part of the story that everyone seems to be thinking about is that offline out of the courts they'll negotiate sort of a lower deal for Twitter maybe in the 40s. Mm -hmm. um, what, what's the probability of you think that happening? I, I don't put much possibility in that as well. I mean the, the board um, at Twitter um, has to um, move ahead and maximize value for shareholders. The, Judge, um, we think, has very clear precedent. And so far, the early rulings are, you know, helpful, um, and is very clear reason to basically compel Musk to do the deal as agreed. So, forty bucks would be a huge concession, and there's no reason to do that. So, um, no, I, I think your better bet is you're going to do better than that. Okay, so you think that Musk has to end up paying what he said he would pay for this business, yeah. but where does that leave Twitter? I mean, there's a lot of, there would be a lot of uncertainties about where Elon Musk would want to take Twitter, even if yeah. he'd gone in, well, even if he remained a willing buyer. But now hmm. he's, it, it, by your reasoning, he's going to end up being a buyer who really doesn't want to buy this asset, or certainly not at the price he's yeah. had to pay. I mean, what kind of assumptions can you make about the future direction of the business in that environment? Well, it's it's not going to be our in our lap. It's going to be in um, Elon Musk's lap, and that's uh, what the board is working for right now. Is the shareholders? Look, I have tons of sympathy for the employees at Twitter. I mean, this is really uh, a terrible circumstance. Um, you know, I don't know what Elon will do. I don't know that any of us do. I I would hope that um, he would refocus and use some of his genius um, to figure out um, the best road for Twitter. Um, he clearly has a lot of abilities. And if he brings them to bear, maybe there could be a good outcome at the end of the day here. Um, and you also um, are looking at a neutral rating on Snap. And obviously, the yeah. stock is down you know, 36% today. It was just yeah. destroyed before that. Your price target is 14. We're at 10. 14 feels really far away at this point. How do we get there for Snap? Well, um, look, this is uh, an incredibly volatile stock. And, um, you know, I think that the Fundamentals, uh, you know, I believe warrant the neutral rating, the $14 price target, um, you know, is compared to a, a, a stock that's clearly moved a lot. So who knows what it'll be in the next couple of days after it settles down. Um, you know, I think the $14 price target is really based on the assumption that this is a real business. You know, there was much that was difficult in terms of the ad recession that we've seen at Snap and at Twitter, um, you know, big step downs in growth from in the second quarter from the first quarter and trending that suggests it's getting worse in the third quarter. And uh, but they did grow users at Snap. And uh, mm -hmm. I think that in time when the macro recovers, the eyeballs will drive the advertising. We'll see growth again at Snap. And uh, um, so, you know, the there is a business here 
Um, and right. if you're long term enough, um, you know, there might be entry points that are interesting, but right now we're not pushing that. Okay, and should this story from Snap, Barton, be as uh, impactful on other big tech names as it seems to have become? Because this is the second time in a row that we've heard bad news from Snap and it's taken down yeah. really big names in the tech sector. I'm looking at Meta Platforms down 6%, Alphabet down, what, 3.3% by, mm. you know, by points. These are the biggest negative drags on the NASDAQ right now. Does that make sense to right. you? Um, look, I think that it does. You know, I am still recommending Alphabet. I think that they're ad exposed, but they have a lot of strengths relative to peers. And that would be one company you'd like to own even through a recession. Mm -hmm. um, valuation is not really, um, I think, demanding there. The, uh, what we've seen, though, is, is obvious deceleration, obvious macro headwinds at Snap and at Twitter. We haven't seen the others report. They'll come next week. But everything we've heard ahead of time in terms of headcount, um, um, controls, cost controls, um, you know, cautious chatter from some of the media companies on the TV side at the conferences, uh, you know, tells it that, that this is real. You know, you look at the telecom companies, which are big advertisers, um, talking about, you know, cautious consumer environments. Um, you know, things are getting tougher. Um, and I think we'll see that when the other Internet guys report next week. So right now you've got to position yourself for an ad recession and think about do you are you, do you want to have any exposure. If you do, you know, I'd like Alphabet. I think they'll come out good on the other side. But we're going into a rocky road. You got to be prepared for that. Uh, so where does that leave um, Apple, Barton? There's been uh, some downgrades, uh, price target downgrades this week. Part's a dollar story. The other part is just a weakening environment. I'm um, reporting yeah. uh, next week uh, uh, on Thursday, I think it is. Uh, Morgan Stanley, though, is really bullish uh, on their services shift, saying that could hit $3 trillion. Is that in the same spot as Google? Like, if we're going into a recessionary environment, Apple's obviously going to get hit, but longer term, it's OK. Yeah. How do you view it? Look, I have a neutral rating on Apple, and um, you know I know it's a much loved equity. But um, you know our concerns are one part is services, and another part is China exposure. And I do believe that in uh, services, um, they can escape ad headwind, ad headwinds. You know, if mm -hmm. Google is seeing it, they'll see it. Um, and services, I think they're extracting uh, larger fees than I think they can sustain long term. I think that Google Play has already conceded a lot on fees and. Their app store uh, revenues and Google Play were uh, down uh, in the first quarter. And I think Apple isn't seeing that, but I think they're likely to have to go there. And I think China never ending COVID zero is a difficult backdrop for durability of uh, consumer demand in China, which is an important end market, and the stability of production. And I think a lot of the smartphone sales that we mm -hmm. saw, the strength we saw at Apple was 5G driven, and we're starting to comp that. In fact, AT&T was you know, talking yesterday about expectations for less sales of this generation of phone than the year ago. So, um, you know, I think for Apple, you want to see mm -hmm. a great new product and Apple Car is not going to happen in a supply chain disrupted environment like this with so much turnover. And, uh, you know, I'm not a believer in the AR VR as a, a monumental change. And I think they're tiptoeing in that to begin with. So, yeah, you know, a difficult spot for Apple. Um, that's why we're neutral. I do have to point out, though, and this is really for my team, my phone has stopped working at this point, so I'm going to have to get a new iPhone. Yeah. I say this because yeah. it took me like <laughs> eight years to get a new iPhone. I had like the four for a very long time. Um, hey, Barton, yeah. thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. Great stuff. Barton Crockett, Senior Research Analyst at Rosenblatt Securities. All right, coming up, we're going to stay with earnings for a moment, how consumers are now managing inflation. We're going to ask the CEO of one of the biggest regional banks in the U.S., uh, Steve Steinauer of Huntington Bank Shares, will be joining us. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Rachel K. Gupta. You're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, Brian Deese, the director of the U.S. National Economic Council, joining Bloomberg Television, 12.30 p.m. New York time. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. I'm Rishika Gupta. There's another sign that a recession may be on the horizon in the euro area. Private sector activity in the region unexpectedly shrank this month for the first time since the pandemic lockdowns of early 2021. A survey of purchasing managers by S&P Global dropped to a 17-month low. Manufacturing output fell and service sector growth almost stalled. 
Fed Chair Jerome Powell probably will slow the pace of interest rate hikes after a second straight 75 basis point increase next week. That's according to economists surveyed by Bloomberg. They expect policymakers to raise rates a half point in September and then shift to quarter point hikes the last two meetings of the year. And in New York State, the Republican candidate for governor was attacked at a campaign event. Officials say a man with a pointed weapon tried to drag Congressman Lee Zeldin to the ground before being subdued. No one was hurt. The attack took place outside the city of Rochester. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Anna. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks to Ritika. Now, Bank of America chairman and CEO Brian Moynihan sees inflation peaking, but we're not quite there yet. He says the Fed has more work to do. Moynihan spoke to Bloomberg's David Weston. I think the Fed is raising rates quickly, which is the tool they have, and also telling people what they're, what they're doing and, and being transparent. And if, if you start to see some adjustments being made, uh, the rate of increase in certain areas has tipped over a little bit, but there's still work to do. In the end of the day, the Fed's toughest job is the, the fact that it's trying to slow down an economy which has strong employment, strong wage growth, and strong spending. And, and that's not the usual, you know, that's an unusual case to see all that going at once. And, and, and by the way, with the U.S. being one of the strongest economies in the world. And so I think they've got a tough job ahead of them, but they're using the tools they have, which is to basically raise rates and change the balance sheet, but more importantly, to tell people what they're doing. And you're seeing the markets adjust to that. Uh, Brian, you have so many ways at Bank of America of looking into the U.S. economy, getting a sense of where it really is. Uh, one of the big questions is, do we think inflation has peaked? If you were asked that question, what would you say? Well, I think it'd be different for different areas. So you're seeing in some areas the rate of increase slow down and it's starting to tip over. Uh, but you're seeing other areas, you know, wage growth is still very strong. So I, I don't think it's peaked yet. And you know, our economists would say it's peaking probably is, is our team. Our team basically says that the Fed will raise, keep continue to raise rates. And, and actually, uh, Candace Browning Platinum the team, the research team at, at Bank of America has the uh, year-end recession, which they made a call on a few weeks ago. But it's a it's a slight recession, and the recession is not accompanied by high unemployment, which means it ought to right itself and come back out. But it's more the impact of the Fed raising rates and slowing economy. So it's peaking. It's probably more appropriate than peak. That was Bank of America Chairman and CEO Brian Moynihan speaking to Bloomberg. And you can watch that full interview later on today on Wall Street Week with David Weston at 6 p.m. in New York, 11 p.m. in London. Great lineup for you. Well, joining us now more on the Fed's inflation challenge as well as what it means for the consumer and businesses is Steve Steinauer, Chairman, President and CEO of Huntington Bank Shares. Huntington is a top U.S. regional bank with one of the country's largest small business administration loan originators. The company reported record earnings this quarter. Steve, it's great to get your perspective. You're in the heart of the country. You have huge exposure to the consumer as well as to commercial businesses. Are we headed for a recession? What are you hearing from your clients? Well, thank you, Alex, for being able to join you this morning. Uh, our clients are clearly concerned. There's uh, so much discussion about uh, uh, recession as a consequence of inflation. The Fed clearly has to fight inflation. And as, as we all expect, uh, you know, there'll be rate increases throughout this year that will help do that. Um, with that, and by way of background, these businesses have been labor constrained and supply chain constrained for years. And so there's an unfilled demand that's been out there for quite a time, period of time. And that continues. Some supply chains have improved, but we chronically hear that there's a labor shortage. And uh, we've seen China open and shut uh, as, a, as a key supplier of many industries in the U.S. Uh, multiple times this year. And, and so we are not out of the woods in terms of supply chain. Now, that benefits the, the Midwest and other manufacturing sectors, but particularly the Midwest, where we're seeing a lot of capital expenditure and investment going in for plant equipment, uh, means to automate and bring the productivity up to meet demand. Okay. Yeah, that's an interesting dynamic, isn't it? As labor continues to be scarce, to what extent we see investment. And let me tap into your, no your knowledge and your, your connections within uh, the sort of small and mid-sized business community then, Steve, to get a bit more of a sense as to how they're feeling. When you talk to them, are they saying they're worried about recession just because everybody else is? Or do they say that their businesses are starting to hurt already? How far into this do you, do you sense we are? We're very early in, into it, but they are clearly worried. There's a, a general communication around recession, a slight recession, a shallow recession. So they're not spending money unless they have to at this point, but they're, they're, they're in very good positions generally. There's been a, a number of significant years. They've deleveraged, they have liquidity, 
the consumer has liquidity. So we're well positioned at this stage to go, if there is a, a slight recession, to go into one and hopefully bounce back out. Demand is very strong. It's not being fulfilled in many sectors. We see it in our day-to-day -day lives. Think about uh, restaurants, hotels, mm -hmm. uh, uh, baggage claim that you know uh, areas in these in these airports now are like stacked warehouses. Yeah. So there's just not enough labor, and that's going to be an ongoing problem. And I think that will work ultimately to the advantage of a slight recession. Um, Steve, along those same lines, this doesn't help the labor problem, but along the same lines, we hear a lot about onshoring, right? We're going to build stuff here so we don't have to worry about the supply chain issues. Since you're in the Rust Belt there, you have a unique view on this. Um, are, are companies actually doing it? Are they going to spend the money onshoring right now? Well, we see a massive amount of investment going on. We're the uh, fifth, sixth, seventh largest equipment financier in the country. And so there's a huge amount of investment that's being made. We had a record second quarter in equipment finance. And usually our fourth quarter is, is the best quarter of the year. So our backlogs are very, very strong, and we're, 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 uh, we're excited about what we see going forward in terms of investment, both in terms of building plant and equipment for the onshoring or nearshoring capabilities, but also expansion. Again, a lot of unfulfilled demand exists, and, uh, and, and, and there's still massive amounts of liquidity by consumers, businesses, and, and state and local governments. Mm, yeah, Steve, you mentioned consumers there. Let me get your sense of where we are on the U.S. consumer right now, because a lot of people have mentioned, yes, companies have strong balance sheets coming out of the pandemic, and so do consumers where they've been able to save. But at the same time, we see a lot of, uh, a lot of banks talking about the amount, of, uh, the amount that customers are now relying on credit cards that might play well for banks. But what does that mean for the consumer, do you think, Steve? Well, the consumer still is uh, very substantially liquid. And... Uh, there's been so much more mortgage refinance over the years, it's, it's increased substantially disposable income. So the consumer's never been in better shape in my 40 years in banking. Uh, it doesn't mean they'll be impervious to this, but I think what the Fed's doing, focused on inflation, trying to break it and bring it back down, cost of energy, cost of foods, reducing that in the near term is absolutely the imperative. And that mm -hmm. will help all consumers and, and frankly flow through to business as well. Um as we are sort of moving into this very uncertain environment, Steve, um, would you be interested in buying more stuff? You bought a Capstone Partners back in March. You're expanding to that middle M&A market. Things are no doubt going to go on sale, particularly if we're headed for some kind of slight recession, as you're intimating. Well, Capstone Partners is a fabulous uh, uh, opportunity for us. We know them well. Great culture, great people. We're excited. They're a middle market company. That's generally what, what our business activities revolve around. And so this is like a, a marriage made in heaven. Now, we also bought a payments company in the second quarter uh, that's a business to consumer. It was a terrific opportunity for us. There may be others that present themselves. And if so, uh, these would be payments related or somehow building out our capabilities, generally fee businesses. We would look to, to pursue those. But the, uh, but the focus is on driving the core. We had a great growth in the second quarter, record level of performance almost hitting on all cylinders, and we're, we're very focused on continuing to do that. Mm. Steve, what are your hiring plans right now? Well, we're hiring in certain businesses. Now, we just a year ago completed a large acquisition of a company called TCF. So that combination has given us great new markets, uh, uh, Colorado, uh, Minnesota. Uh, we're now a, a meaningful presence in Chicago, but it's also given us wonderful national businesses. Uh, our equipment finance doubled, our inventory finance, a brand new business, a host of new businesses, all of which are doing well and reflected uh, in the results that we just posted for the second quarter. Okay, Steve, thank you so much for your time. Steve Steinauer, Chairman and President and CEO of Huntington Bank Shares. Thank you very much for your time. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Markets. We're just coming up to the European close, so still half an hour to go until we close these European markets. But let's have a look at where we are trading right now. Ashley's seen some strength coming through, perhaps less affected by the negativity surrounding tech earnings today. And so uh, stocks are actually up half a percent on the stock 600. The euro was volatile earlier on, now pretty flat. The German five-year yield reflecting some of the data we had earlier on. We've seen money going into bond markets. So we're buying stocks. We're also buying bonds as those expectations around the ECB and just how much hiking it gets to do 
before recession feels re uh, fears really come to the fore. Uh, that seems to be the story in Europe as we come to the close uh, this Friday, or at least in half an hour we will. The pound is up by four tenths of one percent against the US dollar as Brexit uh, rears its head once again. We'll talk more about that in the next part of the programme. We'll also deep dive into that data about Europe. Chris Williamson joins us, IHS Market Chief Economist. This is Bloomberg.